Amazing. I, I want to first say a huge thank you to um, Read and Resist and the whole team. It's an honour to be part of this um, day and to speak alongside groups like Cradle, Abolitionist Futures, Ruthie and Craig Gilmore, um, who I've learned so much from, basically, about abolition. Um, so I want to begin with a short reflection from my book, Experiments in Imagining Otherwise, on the nature of design. In order to reflect on what abolition feminism means in the everyday, we first have to think about what the everyday is made up of. What is its current texture? How does it feel? How is it constructed? This is important because we must understand not only our political conditions, but our architectural and linguistic conditions as well. If we find ourselves at a political impasse, uh, where less and less seems possible every day, then abolition feminism plays some role in helping us break through that impasse or going around it, or at the very least, exposing the linguistic and architectural traps that build the texture of everyday life. Abolition feminism breathes life back into the everyday and reminds us, as Dr. Gilmore does, that where life is precious, life is precious. When I think of the everyday, I think about the accumulation of figures and structures that build landscapes, hopes, desires, and wishes that define the parameters of what we want, what we can have, what we might imagine for ourselves and others, what is actionable, and what we dare to conceive of. So a note on um, the design of our everyday lives. What is the structure of the everyday? I'm gonna first start by, uh, with a quote by June Jordan. And she says, I would wish us to indicate the determining relationship between architectonic reality and physical well-being. I hope that we may implicitly instruct the reader in the comprehensive impact of everywhere, of any place. This requires development of an idea or theory of place in terms of human being, of space designed as the volumetric expression of successful existence between earth and sky, of space cherishing as it amplifies the experience of being alive, the capability of endless beginnings and the entrusted liberty of motion, of particular space connected to multiple spatialities, a particular space that is open, receptive and communicant, yet sheltering particular life." And the quote ends there. We don't um, often think that the layout of a house or a street can determine our capacity for being. Living as we do on top of one another, with no room to stretch our legs or for our children to play, and being so isolated, not knowing our next door neighbours, not knowing whom we could depend on in an emergency, is a political question. Design is more than just an architectural component. It is more than just the arrangement of physical objects in order to make something. Design is also the speech we use to build and give meaning to the world around us. June Jordan knew this. If you changed how people conceived of living, you could also change their understanding of themselves and their relations with others, breaking the inertia of this unlivable life. The way we talk about this life and living, the language we use, builds a kind of structure that turns the horizon, the point where potentiality meets the substance of our reality, into a mirage. When, for example, we say housing for all and the government responds with the homeless are being temporarily housed in hotels to avoid the spread of the virus, they are building a linguistic structure that defines the realm of the possible, that implicitly tells us to want less, to expect that total reconfiguration is out of the question. Like a poorly designed building, linguistic structures affect how we think, breathe, move and act. The mold sticks to our skin. We are familiar with a particular kind of linguistic structure, the preservation of a system of organization that places capital before all else. This system ties our hands and feet together. But if we follow Jordan, everywhere and any place has a comprehensive impact. And so everything we do and say that brings place and space into existence, that defines its contours, that explicitly makes clear who can and cannot enter also has an impact. To get free, we have to redesign linguistic uh, structures before they morph into linguistic loops, or in the meantime, at least get comfortable with repetition. So part two. Freedom is shorthand for the object of history. If we begin with the humble assertion that freedom is a place and that freedom is the object of history, two thoughts that I take from Dr. Gilmore, 
then to consider what abolition feminism means in the everyday means to consider how we collectively craft, sustain and protect and defend the place of freedom in the here and now. The object of history has previously been theorized in many ways as a struggle between those who own the means of production and those who do not as a struggle against imperialism, extraction and exploitation, as a struggle against racialized and gender-based violences, a struggle between the forces that oppress and the forces that are oppressed. What would it mean to consider the object of history, freedom, as something we could hold in our hands? It means understanding that the here and now, the substance of the everyday, is already infused with a political determination. Abolition feminisms, uh, feminism helps us think as a theory of demands and collective yearnings. It starts first with the critique of how gender is mobilized in favor of the border, policing, carcerality, imperialism, the surveillance appara uh, apparatus, and then it refuses. Abolition feminism helps us think about how the state utilizes gender in its arbitration between classes. Tensions arise when gender becomes the site of um, legitimization through which states reproduce violent conditions. So the prison exists to protect women. Police are necessary to save sex workers and trafficking victims and so on. Often what we want is relegated to the places, becomes a code word for not possible. If what we want is always in front of us, never amongst us, never beside or around us, then pursuing freedom becomes an almost impossible task. Linear temporality would have us believe that the past, present and future are distinct temporal regimes, that progress is forward movement in a singular direction. Against this kind of notion of historical time, the time of events, stands many other forms of temporality, errant time, rebellious time, quiet time, rumbling time, spiral time. It is possible to build and make using the substance of the everyday. Uh, sorry, if it is possible to build and make using the substance of the everyday, then our task is no longer linear and no longer forward facing. History unfolds in many different directions at once, and so does its object, freedom. Abolition feminism, a uh, radical political genealogy whose central premise is that freedom is possible and that freedom is the thing that constitutes history, gives us back the capacity to transform our political material conditions as workers, as people, as lovers. It gives us the power to say that what we do matters now, but is also not distinct from what has been done and what will be done for the sake of our lives. It does this by asking us to reconsider the role of institutions, um, of the institutions and power structures that determine the fortunes of our everyday life. The prison is an extractive machine that takes away all the things that make freedom possible. Relation, agency, resource, temporality, space, creation. The police exist to prop up um, the legitimacy of a state that is built on the suppression of the proletariat. Abolition feminism asks, could it be otherwise? And that otherwise is not something we reach uh, towards in order to grasp with our two hands. That otherwise might already exist in this temporal moment, this location, in this place. If we conceptualize the everyday as a zone that moves between the sharp temporal distinctions of the past, present and future, then it is possible to harvest freedom in this zone. Freedom in this zone has some connection to freedom in the past and in the future. An example, against um, liberal anxieties about the mass release of individuals from prison tomorrow, instead of responding um, with reassurances, saying things like advocates for prison and police abolition do not mean the release of people tomorrow, which is something we often hear. If we understand the everyday, the present as a zone of possibility, we could instead ask ourselves as practitioners of abolition feminism, what kind of systems, structures, modes and of organization would we need to build, um, uh, would we need to build a world where that need could be met? In order to do this, I think we'd have to stop the clock as we know it, to give ourselves back the space to think of the present, the time of today, right now, this second, the next five minutes, is dripping with the same political multitudes uh, uh, as tomorrow, next week, the next decade. 
Understanding the significance of abolition feminism in the everyday means recasting the everyday, not only as a space of rehearsal, but also as a space of actualization. We don't orientate ourselves towards a future that is yet to come and constantly eludes us. We might be able to touch, taste, smell, see that vision in the here and now. What are we waiting for? Abolition feminism instructs us um, to make what we cannot yet conceive of through political organizing inside and outside of institutions, to understand that the prison is, all, uh, is always um, being opposed, resisted, even if it does not feel like it. The people inside resist the thing um, that wants to, as Gwendolyn Brooks writes, crumble them, to sicken them. They, pers they persist in the non-cheering dark. In the here and now, conceptualizations of the everyday seem weighed down by the oppressive power of institutions. The prison uh, remains standing. We see police walking the streets every day. Women like Joy Gardner, Sarah Everard, Sarah Reed are killed by police. Women like Biba Henry and Nicole Smallman are mocked by police after their deaths. Women like Sianda are imprisoned for defending themselves from racialized violence. We are part of families that inflict violence on us. Our local community centers are underfunded, shut down, served eviction notices. Gentrification forces us out of the places we have lived in our whole lives. We feel the force of poverty shaping decisions. Our aunts and uncles are sex people are executed by the police on the same streets we use to buy our Christmas presents. As students of abolition feminism, we belong, as Lauren Ballant tells us, to a section of people that other people would think of as defeated. But we are, as they tell us again, trying to find a way to stay attached to life from within it. This, posi uh, this positioning necessitates a belief that the everyday is not a dead zone. We can animate it, we do animate it. When we intervene in a police stop and search or write letters and coordinate resources for those in prison, when we start or bolster the campaign to free Siander, when we withdraw consent to be policed and begin to fight back against legislation, expanding police power in the streets, in our communities, when we spontaneously stop a deportation in action by calling others to stop the van from leaving, when we demand, demand the mass release of prisoners during the deadly pandemic, or raise funds for bail, or lie down in front of um, charter flights that will ship people to offshore detention, detention centers and prisons. When we fight back against austerity by protecting our local services, ensuring that they remain open. When we occupy the visitor center of the largest women's prison in Europe, demanding that the land be used for social housing and buildings that enable people access to grassroots care and transformative justice. When we refuse to cooperate with the CPS or scupper plans for the building of a new prison for non-binary inmates, or when we call secure schools what they are, prisons under another name. This is how we animate the everyday using a feminist and abolitionist logic. From the animation, we can expand our strategies and responses and begin to scale them up via coalition building. We remember that if we belong to a history of the defeated, it is only because our visions of social organization are too capacious to be tolerated by the gatekeepers of the everyday. When I'm on the train home from work or the library, it's always those questions of freedom I come back to. I find myself stuck on the question of how transport, education, housing, resource might appear differently in that place of freedom. I wouldn't be me sitting in this space with these people. I might have access to an entirely different set of performances, relations, feelings. I, and by extension, we could be different. The quotidian repetitive nature of life is such that we can forget the impact of making sharp interventions in the castle landscapes that we call home. Between birthdays, personal projects, seeing friends, it sometimes seems that there's little space to bring about the conditions that would make life worth living. But the prison is not an inevitability. To bring about its end, we must begin to act as if what we do in the zone of the everyday is critical, because it is. I do not mean that politics should be reduced to the level of minor life so that the site of struggle shrinks to micro interpersonal interactions. That's a, the curse of allyship, I think. We need a more robust comradeship, transformation that begins with an understanding that we have a responsibility to enact ethical relation. In the UK, we've seen how neoliberalism, the concentration of wealth from the working class upwards, the turn towards free market economics, the securitization and privatization of life and decimation of infrastructures of social care have worked to atomize our communities. Reconceptualizing abolition at the, at the level of the everyday does not mean that we simply do life interpersonally. Um, never with a desire to build mass movements, propagandize, polit politically educate on a wider scale or to coordinate. 
I mean to say that understanding abolition feminism from the level of the everyday means reconceiving the everyday daily repetitive temporality as a site of freedom. It can be a site of freedom if we make it and if we loosen our attachment to understanding freedom, the object of history as something that can be finished. Part three. I've tried um, in this intervention to speak kind of broadly and semi-theoretically to the ideas of the everyday and why I understand abolition feminism to be. But for the avoidance of doubt emerging from uh, kind of black uh, Marxist communist feminist histories, abolition and feminism provides us with a liberatory vision for the organization of social life free from all forms of violence, which necessitates an end to castle logics and all forms of imprisonment, surveillance, counter-terror, policing, punishment, and exile. Exile. It necessarily involves a Marxist critique of how uh, prisons congeal surplus land, labor, and capital in, uh, in any given geographic location. Abolition feminism instructs us to notice how education, housing, and the benefit system have, under successful neoliberal governments, begun to merge with policing and surveillance, bringing the, the latter far more legitimacy. There are police in our schools, universities, in our housing estates, education and housing agencies have made a pact to spy on children to identify signs of early radicalization. Domestic violence services collude with the home office. It helps us to understand that the violence against women's sector in the UK, I think, is underpinned by a deep attachment to carcerality as a means of offering women safety. Abolition feminism helps us understand that though sometimes we may operate under the same name, feminist, we must stand in opposition to those feminists that would use our radical methodology in order to fortify the prison instead of destroy it. The workshops in this conference, I think, will go into far greater detail uh, about how to bring about the visions I've, I've tried to hint at. I'm focused on asking why, partly because asking why is another way that we can animate everyday life. Alongside being someone kind of precariously and in ways unwillingly situated in academia, I'm also a writer. And I, I think writing adds another texture to everyday life and can help us navigate the tensions we feel as people who are continuously moving through landscapes of extraction, dispossession and violence. Um, so I want to end by reading an extract from a novel that I'm writing, very tentative, um, that I hope illustrates the title of this intervention. So Adj, the character in this extract, is navigating the tensions brought about by carceral landscapes um, that she is experiencing at the level of the everyday, but she is persisting. The leaflet reads, see a raid, don't walk by, we can uh, resist raids together. Make sure people know they don't have to answer any questions and can leave. Um, if they want to leave, walk away with them. Film immigration officers and police. If someone is being detained, check with them first or only film officers. Challenge the officers. Why are they questioning specific people? Tell people around you what's happening. Call your friends. Tweet anti-raids to get the word out. If someone is detained, give them these numbers. Bail for immigration detainees 0207 456 9750. SOAS detainee support 0743 840 7570. Kay and Adj are passing these leaflets out on the high street. The sun is beating down, hot and dry. It makes the stains on the tarmac more obvious. Adj is wearing pink toned sunglasses, which give everything a rosy glow. Her dreads are swept back in a low bun. She's wearing a dress and she feels silly wearing it. Most people ignore the two, refuse to take a leaflet, refuse to acknowledge what they secretly already know, that they do not care about the fates of the people who pick their fruit, who give them a bowl of grapes for a pound or serve them cheap and delicious food when all other restaurants close at 11 p.m. on a Wednesday. They'd rather not be confronted with this reality as they went about their days, but Adj and Kay, dressed entirely in black, represent an interruption. And so their contempt for their own commitment to individualism is projected back onto these two queers who are trying to make the world more complicated than grocery shopping and feeding the kids and making sure that your wife is happy. In the summer, immigration officers and police scurry out of relative obscurity and begin an almost methodical strategy of targeting local businesses, trying to make connections between riders, staff, and anyone else they have deemed to be in the country illegally. Last year was the biggest crackdown this part of North London had ever seen. They demolished an entire uh, village community. 
So many of the traits, uh, the fates of the traders are still unknown. Aj knows that local organizing groups followed up with some of the men who had been deported. She knows through gossip and secondhand information that many of them died shortly after they were deported. It's the stress that kills them, that killed them. She knows that. There is a pit buried deep down where she st stores away all of the movements, wins and losses. The pit is almost full which means that she finds herself on the brink of tears when she sees a child running after their father in the park. It could be any child on any given day. This particular one is wearing a blue checkered dress, gray tights and a navy cardigan. She is riding a scooter that is far too big for her tiny frame. Her father is standing by the side of the road, playfully pretending that he will trip her as she zooms up and down the jagged pavement. Adj offers her enough space to move by them with ease, as if she is saying, these streets do not belong to me, they're ours. The little girl smiles and zooms off, not even out of breath. That's when the tears travel up from her chest and sting her. She can only think of what this little girl has yet to realize about what kind of cruelty becomes justifiable under the logics of carcerality. Adj has never witnessed a raid and secretly she doesn't want to. She is afraid of her own cowardice, she fears that she might forget to make, pe uh, make sure people know they don't have to ask questions or that the numbers she has meticulously memorized will suddenly escape her. Adj thinks that she inherited this fear from her mother who always fetishized obedience and instilled in her a fear of being in trouble. It stops her from being able to question the officer who is detaining the girl who looks no older than 16. This is just a psychoanalytic excuse for being a coward Sometimes her own cowardice gets in the way of the dismantling of carceral landscapes, a term she learned recently whilst watching a talk by a well-known scholar who defined it as the ways violent institutions and the landscapes in which they are situated collide and become enmeshed. What would it mean to think about a postcode or area or town, first thinking about the prison or the police station, and, and then about how everything gets sucked in from there, how everything res revolves around this point? In becoming more involved, in standing here and giving these leaflets for the first time with Kay, she is choosing not to succumb to the cowardice that might follow her around her life. She is deciding that her own fear is not more important than other people and what they demand of her. It feels trite to weep for the lives of people you do not know, but nothing else can cure it. Nothing else makes sense to do. When you have tried your very best to prevent violence, and it shows you its multiplicity anyway. Aj wonders about this, the authority to pick someone up in the middle of their life, bundle them away and call that order. All this happens in silence, tacitly condoned by citizens who have given over this permission to the state. The agreement is as follows. In return for a somewhat stable life, you agree that all politics is theatre and separate from the realities of day-to-day -day existence. The spectacle is best summed up using words and phrases such as law and order, balancing the budget, tough on crime, some viewers may find the following distressing. These words inflate reality and hover just above the heads of those people who ignore the violence that constitutes their lives so they might just get on. What follows is desensitization, true crime podcasts on the school run or whilst brushing your teeth news alerts in the lecture hall or in the middle of coffee with friends, one click, a scroll right to the end, feeling nothing about another forced strip search, another stabbing, another eviction, another prison, prison overdose, another school exclusion, another deportation, another, another, another. Adj thinks that understanding politics through grief and sorrow, not just language, might lead to the burning of some cities. This has happened before and it will happen again. Many feel burning would be a step too far though. Traders smile at them and tell them of their fears. They always seem to have one eye on the door. They shout from stalls in the direction of where uh, the two are standing. Someone with scraped black hair, scruffed trainers and loose fitting clothes has come to relieve them of their shift. They've given out less than a hundred flyers. Adj pulls out the notes app on her phone and writes, the leaflet is a cultural repository too. Carrie's feeling, also is an art object, stays with the carrier, changes something. There is an important question in the last statement, changes something. What is just paper and ink and another place to put chewing gum carries with it the weight of this group's intentions, the ferocity of their political desire. Uh, despite all the grief and pain that is trying to immobilize them, they are creating new cultural objects that just won't quit. 
that will bring someone to a meeting and or help them make an intervention that otherwise uh, they would not make. They are fortifying the spaces of survival pending revolution. Eventually, these leaflets will line rubbish bins or be stuck to the walls of a rented flat by a group of 20 somethings. They might meticulously be kept in a personal archive by the, uh, by the person or people whose idea it was to put these words in this formation in the first place. What strange magic, what a peculiar life affirming way to say the fight is not over, not whilst we are still breathing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lola. That was really beautiful and such an important foregrounding for the day. Um, yeah, really, really appreciated kind of the centering on the everyday, especially the kind of bit that you mentioned around like how we, when we talk about abolition, how do we like really kind of switch switch our kind of ways of thinking and like when change can happen and how can we reframe those questions to actually center it again on the everyday so thank you so much um i want to open it up for comments and questions um if anybody would like to um just raise your hand um or um pop a question in the chat Somebody in the chat, um, Amy, has asked for some more information about the novel. So when, where can we look out for your novel? <laughs> I know you said it was very tentative. But... Very tentative. <laughs> Sorry, someone has just started doing the most intense building works outside of my front door. I'm, I'm sure everybody had that. Um, uh, the novel is being written maybe in like two and a half years if I ever have uh, time to finish it. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been a nice way to explore um, political questions, I guess, in a different tone and, and different register. And I think the reason why I included it was because I feel like um, novels or like uh, creative writing can help us to kind of like elucidate what the everyday kind of feels like, because I think the everyday is lived at the level of like feeling at a kind of like effective relational level. Um, and so I thought that, yeah, it, it might be kind of useful to include. But thank you so much. And I think Lamble has a question. Go ahead, Lamble. Yeah, thank you for that. It was so beautiful and just like so poetic and so um, illuminating of so many things. I, I, I can't wait to listen to it again in the recording. Um, I wanted to pick up on the question actually that uh, around the different mediums, because I think your work is, is so helpful in that, you know, there's a lot of academic work that's trying to communicate abolitionist ideas then there's activist work that's trying to communicate those ideas and they use different mediums to do that. And sometimes they cross over and sometimes they don't. But I feel like in your work, you're trying to also like bring those things together, but also through kind of poetic and like your experiments book is really trying to kind of think in a different way or express in a different way. And I just wondered if you could say more about how that process is for you. And in terms of, because I think it's so powerful in reaching audiences that might not engage with some of the other kind of forms. And so it's a question about, I guess, how your thoughts on how we're trying to engage different people and bring different people into abolition feminism in a way that's not like preachy, but is like bringing people along, which I think is really so powerful about your work. I think that's um, such a good question. And I, I think there is a kind of um, baseline, like a critique of academia, which is that um, it's kind of inaccessible. And for me, what more, more than that, what I actually found myself interested in when I was, um, so I, I work on the like uses of the imagination. And so it's kind of in a cultural studies or um, yeah, of the field of cultural production. What stuck out to me most was that um, political ephemera, speeches, songs, organizing, the things that we make like the zines um, as part of kind of like uh, political education, those are never conceptualized as creative projects. And um, for me, like, I guess what I'm trying to 
do with my work is expand the scope of what counts as um, artistic production. Not to say that all art is politics, because I, of course it isn't, um, but to say that any kind of action or any uh, piece of material or ephemera or post or whatever that is produced in the service of a political vision of relation of a liberatory um, uh, uh, with the desire for liberatory social relations is an art object and, and should be also thought of as an art object because um, art enables us a way to think differently about the lives that we um, uh, inhabit and, and, the, and the futures that we wish to enact. I think that there is a you can get to a real kind of dry, I'm trying to find the sweet spot between like the kind of vulgar materialist rejection of anything to do with pleasure. And also this like overindulgence in a liberal art market of like the art object as the sole um, evidence of politics. I think that there is, without overstating the role of what art does in life, I still think that it, it adds a different dimension um, that like, like you said, enables people to engage with the desire that is at the root of every political demand. Because I also think on an effective level, um, engaging people in terms of their yearnings, their wants, their desires for a better set of relations is how you build the impetus to resist and how actually you get them to a space of action. I think like including that that piece, um, uh, the uh, novel extract, um, focusing on this idea of like cowardice, I'm always I'm always struck by that question of what stops people from making those interventions when they can, and it's always fear. It's always a, a cowardice. Maybe it's a like a an introspection, and I think that art has some some way of undoing that. It has it has some way of um, galvanizing that maybe like I could I could like purely academic language doesn't right because understanding something theoretically is different to feeling it which I think is important and is also I guess a feminist principle thank you were there any more questions or comments for Lola Kirsten go ahead Hello, hi. I think you um, probably sort of answered it already, but I was just interested in um, whether you thought that sort of actually taking time out to be creative and encouraging creativity is sort of almost subversive in itself, especially for women. And I wondered whether you felt that actually the process of being creative, even if it's not political, actually helps change structures in your brain that you, you kind of can start unknowing some of the stuff that you sort of know without even thinking about it like the way that we're married to these structures around us because we've never thought that anything could be different from that and I just wondered whether you thought the process of just being creative could help. Thank you for that question yeah absolutely I think that um Anything like I think the process of making is one of the um, kind of rarest, like being able to enact a cre creativity is one of the like rarest and special, most special things that we can do in an environment of violence. But I also think the second that that enters any kind of economy or market, the second that you produce a book to be sold or a painting to be bought and sold, the, the radical potential of that creativity is kind of stripped from it. Um, and so like to actual, to, to, I guess to answer your question, I do believe um, that creativity goes some way in opening up new kind of pathways um, in terms of our relationships with other people, but also what is what it is possible to conceive of. And I think we've seen the ways that like letter writing, for example, like letter writing to people in prison we might think of that purely as an act of solidarity, but for me, it's also a creative act that carries with it the texture of the everyday in and outside of a bordered zone, right? Like, obviously there are reasons why prisons are tucked away in the landscapes that we um, exist in. And I think that um, the example of letter writing is one way that creativity is able to kind of seep through those, um, those barriers that have been enacted precisely to stop relation and to stop any kind of, um, uh, connection to the outside. Um, so yeah, so I think it, I, for me, it's a, it's a delicate balance because I think politics is politics and that we should be very clear about that. But I also think that um, 
there's a way that we can use creativity to animate our political demands. I think that that best summarizes my position. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Lola, and everybody that asked the questions. Um, we're going to have to wrap up for a short break now before the next session, but just want to say again, Lola, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful kind of start to the day, and I know that we're all feeling really energised. Um, so thank you so much for um, sharing your time with us this morning. Um, so much, Amy.